guys on yeah. stage. And if we could have all of our speakers back up, it'd be wonderful. Unlike the Graham Norton show, you don't get a glass of wine, I'm afraid. I'm going home. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'd like to open up to the floor if anyone has any questions to ask our incredible panel. I'm going to start off. Fantastic. I don't need to start off. Hi. Uh, thanks very much. Three great presentations. Kieran Walsh, I'm a clinical director at BMJ. Um, I guess my question is about AI and big data and machine learning algorithms, which may be pushing us in the wrong direction, using more of our resources to drive them. And I wonder, does anybody have any thoughts on that and what we can do? Pete, I guess. I'm, I'm not an expert in this area, but it's obviously, it's come up a few times. I think people are well aware that um, servers, you know, in compute power has and creates energy. I think the only, the only kind of um, uh, response from, for me in this first instance is that I know that these big tech companies are obviously looking at that. How do they make things more efficient and effective? Um, there's a really good company, actually, you've probably heard of them because they were on the news and they did reach out to us, uh, Deep Green, but they use the heat from their servers to heat swimming pools. And again, a really nice sort of circular economy. So for me, the compute power is not the issue necessarily. It's what we're doing with that wasted energy. It's, you know, it is the, the kind of precious metals that might be going into them servers. But everything, this is why I kind of hope, hold on to innovation. There is lots of things around, like the compressing of data. You know, again, data is frowned upon. We waste a lot of data, emails back and forwards, but data is not the problem. It's just the fact that we've not quite compressed it enough. And and it's a bit like you know, to use that kind of analogy of the the Walkman versus the iPod. You know, we used to all well, I certainly did. You know, with a, a cassette, uh, an individual cassette for each tune, and you know, and Apple did what it did. So it's a good example of like we do need to keep in being innovative and, and change that. So I, 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 it is a problem, obviously, but I, I think it's a problem we can overcome. And I think, again, the benefits outweigh, you know, if we look at all the advancements, I mean, people are discovering new materials with AI, you know, we're able to diagnose quicker. I think those benefits for me still outweigh, but yeah, not without some consideration. Thank you. Any other questions? Thanks, Chris. Hi, great talks. Uh, I've got a comment, uh, which may be a question, and a, a more focused question to Heidi. Uh, the The comment is, I come from a very kind of macho background. Um, in Cyprus, we really enjoy barbecued meats. What would a guy like me say to my father, who pretty much every Sunday goes out and barbecues, and, you know, he's... Uh, a little bit on the obese side. So I uh, oh. I try and convert people with food. <laughs> so I've managed to convert my mom, my dad, my brother, my brother's girlfriend, all my flatmates, <laughs> all my friends just from feeding them and showing them that actually vegan food can be so delicious. And I used to love the taste of meat and there are so many good meat alternatives out there now. Aldi's got these amazing pulled pork ones. So actually when I feed my friends those, they really don't notice the difference. And in terms of the antibiotic use, hormone use, processing, carcinogens actually the processed meats are still better and um, so i would one kill it with food um, and two show them things like the game changers do you know the documentary um, no, I haven't seen that. Okay, so it's uh, specifically designed for this is to reduce the, that that macho association with meat and its bodybuilders and Arnold Schwarzenegger's on it, for example. And it just shows people that you can be a strong endurance athlete, a bodybuilder, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, and it kind of debunks that stigma um, to do with uh, being a manly man and having to eat meat. Mm -hmm. So I'd sit down, show them the documentaries, show them that vegan food can be super delicious and still can taste like meat, and that they don't have to be missing out you want to give them things so that's how i've managed to do it okay that's great thank you thank you for that i just wanted to add on a little bit to that as well it's it, the other thing is it's it's about messaging and about most of what we do within sustainability is about messaging and it's not we don't want everybody to do go to the whole veganism extreme in day one and it's about getting the right message for the right people you know your father you know what he's receptive to you know how he 
thinks, and that gives you a real power to begin to think about your approach and your conversation with him. And it's and I think one of the one of the biggest disservices we do is when we try to do blanket kind of messaging to everybody, and it needs to be much more tailored if we want behavioural change, which is what this is. I could go into the history of Cyprus, but just just before Easter, there's like a 40-day um, fasting period where everyone pretty much eats vegan food, um, including my father. Um, but there's no continuation, and right after Easter, everyone's bar barbecuing again. Um, but thank you for that. Um, the question that I was going to ask uh, more focused towards yourself, Heidi, um, I've started a company that can track and trace uh, medical devices and inventory by scanning the GS1 code. Um, and uh, we've won a smart grant innovation. Uh, and I was just wondering, I'd, I'd, I think I came into your talk a little bit late, but are you using that kind of scanning technology to monitor inventory uh, for sustainability purposes? I'd love to say yes but we are a million miles away from that. And if you think about where inventory sits within the NHS, within trusts, it is, it's a, is a, there's a huge amount of work we're doing on an inventory management program, supporting trusts across the country because of that very issue. And tools like yours are, are really useful, but we have to have the data first. And if we don't have that first step, we can't get to the point where we can use the data. Yep, absolutely. Uh, what what kind of data would you like so I can <laughs> tailor my system? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably a conversation, but kind of. Afterwards. Sure. Okay. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks very much, guys. Any other questions from anyone else? Okay, I've got one for you, Heidi. So, um, I work for Napolitano Health. We do a lot of work with our supply chain, trying to align ourselves with what the NHS are asking, so we can have a sector-wide approach. When we've asked a lot of our tier one suppliers, for example, for information on their emissions, a lot of the information we're getting, say, from a big international organization will be UK-based data. So the carbon footprint of, say, I'm not going to name the companies, but the carbon footprint of company A would be really quite surprisingly small, and then you realize that that's actually from their offices in the UK, and most of their stuff is made abroad. How are you combating that through, through the means that you've, you've um, shared with us today? So if you go back to the NHS England Supply Roadmap, the first kind of rungs on the ladder are all about kind of getting people on the journey, and that would be where the kind of the UK base comes in. But if you look at the later mi mi milestones, that's all about getting to that bigger picture. Um, we have an e enormous supply chain, and we've got to bring everybody with us. And whilst it's great that some of the there are some leading partners and we can kind of talk to them and learn from them and kind of spread that knowledge around, not everybody's there. And I think we just need to be really mindful that we move. This is this is a collaboration, and we kind of we all get there or none of us do. So we have to take that spirit in terms of how we work with our suppliers to get to that point. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thank you. Anyone else thought of any more questions? I will just keep asking them and fill the time. No, I'm joking. Any other questions from anyone? Do you have any questions for each other? Oh, we got one. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Not aimed at anyone in particular, and I've, I've just thought of this as something. It's more of a discussion, I guess. But uh, in decarbonizing and going vegan, and the we see a lot of companies producing plant-based physical things, so from packaging going towards cardboard from plastic because that's perceived to be better. But that, uh, and, and of course, when you factor fuel in, there's just been the first, I think, transatlantic flight has in the bait that was, I think it was 100% from waste fats. I don't think it was purely plant-based, but uh, um, the decarbonizing things and fuel leads to pressures on the on food production, on plant production. So I just wondered if there was a if there's a discussion about that and how you get you 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 you, you try and I guess plug one hole and open another one, um, wh where does that go? Sorry, it's a very open question, So, but I think it in probably involves all three of you. I, I'll, I'll go first because I've got hold of the mic. I think somebody spoke about it earlier, and, or I overheard somebody talking about it earlier, to do with the over-reliance on single use that we have, and actually that drives consumption. 
and actually what we re when we're looking at what we're doing we need to be thinking much more circular in terms of reuse of materials and keeping materials in the value chain for as long as possible as high in the value chain as possible um, and that is a huge part of the answer to that question so that we, we kind of we don't we, we don't rob Peter to pay Paul I don't know if I've got anything to, to add necessarily, but I think I've been watching a bit of COP28 and you do realise that there's a lot of contention with that event, isn't there? And, and I think that's the the reality of climate change. You know, one person's opinion is different to another. I think my only ask is that we don't forget talking about net zero. I think that is the reality. You know, there might be those scenarios where there's perverse incentives, but let's keep putting the planet at the heart of the thinking, the decision making. and. Um, you know, we might get things wrong. You know, we might start investing a lot in AI and it might have that detrimental effect for the next two to five years, but then five to 10, it might. So, but unless we keep having that conversation, we're never going to put a spotlight on it. Yeah. And specifically with regards to diet, um, there was a graph on there which showed the proportion of the energy expenditure from transport, the transport aspect of farm to fork and actually that was so minimal so with regards to diet specifically it's actually the, the land use and everything that's actually the biggest contributor so specifically for that yes ideally everything would be local but actually when we're talking about I think that's sli some slight greenwashing actually within the UK um, and we need to be looking about what the ingredient where the ingredients are coming from and how much land water use that that produces anyway. I, I think there also has to be a recognition though if we're going to have a green industrial revolution We've got to ask ourselves what's going to kill us first, all right? So we are going to have to absolutely pillage the earth to make our batteries, mining resources and things like that. But I'd rather do that than have the CO2 continue to rise because that's going to kill us quicker than, than that. But, but we need to do it in ethical ways as well. But there is going to be a bit of robbing Peter to pay for all this. We need to be honest about that. But we need to be as circular as we can in that approach. So making sure that once we have taken some stuff out of the ground, we're not wasting it. <laughs> That's good. I'm keeping, but keep getting my steps in today. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you again. Um, the um, the question is: We often think about um, uh, climate change um, being the problem of the overdeveloped world. Yeah. So in develop developed economies, we have developed practices that are unsustainable. I just want to ask the individual members of the panels what we've seen in countries that aren't overdeveloped or developing economies, what are the already culturally ingrained practices that we could learn and inculcate to kind of take us back from the brink? So you, do you understand the question? So from my perspective, so my heritage is Indian and my heart is kind of in Sri Lanka because I feel very safe there and I feel like they've been through a lot of trauma, but they are very resourceful with the effects of that. After, for example, the tsunami, the civil wars, now there's the political unrest, for example. And I'd say it's very similar to what I've seen in India and I've stayed there for long periods of time to do kind of alternative and herbal medicine. So I've been in the jungles there. They are very, very resourceful and adaptable with what they've got. Um, they do, they are the, the people that are suffering the, the the effects of climate change, then the, the grounds are flooding. You know, you can see the water levels on the buildings. So we need to see exactly what they're doing in order to sustain their their fruit, their their vegetables, their farming, and often that's not they're not able to mitigate it, and that is the reason that we care so much as people that can mitigate it and people that are affecting that so much. So yes, they are very resourceful with what they got, but at the same time they're not able to adapt at a rate that we that we would like them to be able to. Um, and often, you know, a lot of it is actually their their mindset is really really brilliant and resilient. I've been walking around Sri Lanka and India, and they're so giving. They're so they're so caring about their neighbors their doors are always open and they're the people that are being affected the most by the rainfall and the drought and actually it's that that state of community which they have which is so incredible to see when one family when their house kind of gets destroyed by something they're opening their doors to everybody they're sharing their food and it's that community that networking that spirit which is absolutely incredible for me to see and i think we have a lot to learn from that 
only quickly, I uh, love Native American Indians. Uh, and again, I think if you look at their sort of fascination and appreciation for the earth, it's, uh, it's a nice culture to follow. Um, really ironically, I just had a tweet, uh, a text coming through on my phone. Um, I said I'm a flood warden and we're now on standby. So again, it, it does hit you personally and, and I feel for people in deprived communities, what we see on the news, you know, homes being destroyed. Because, you know, straight away there's a, there's a mental, um, uh, you know, battle that I have to kind of face with thinking, God, is that the right house to live in? Because I've seen the flood maps for the location that I live in. The next 10 years, that's all underwater, but... You live in Hull, don't you? Yeah, I do live yeah. in Hull. <laughs> I think I was just going to reflect what, what you said. It's that, there's, there's for me, there's two. There's the, the individualism versus cult, uh, s social aspect of, of our cultures, which are typically Western and Eastern cultures. And actually, the that drive to individualism, but also... Then on top of that, the consumerism are the things that actually we need to unlearn and actually we have a lot to learn from other societies in how we, we, we tackle this. Because for me, the climate crisis is very much that kind of um, meeting point of social, economic and environmental issue that all kind of come together and kind of interact with each other. And actually the fact that we've become so individual means that we're not looking out for the societal needs that we have as we should do. I hope that answers. I think that's, this is such a good question. And I think the scientific community is now starting to learn. I think we've been quite arrogant within science. You know, the, everyone learns from the West. It's, it, I mean, the, the, it's, there's an amazing paper, uh, recent, well, not recently, actually, it's quite old now, um, looking at the carbon footprint of a cataract procedure done in the UK versus the Aravindai Hospital in India. And the difference between the two is just so stark. What can we learn? What can we learn from these people? How are they doing it so efficiently with the same outcomes? The question over here, thanks. Um, thanks much to the three of you. Again, it's not quite a question, more of a comment as well. I find it, I find, and I, I include myself in this, very hypocritical <coughs> in all of these conversations because we're um, in our job, we're more than happy to jump on a transatlantic flight to go to a nice big conference which undoes an entire year of living vegan, for example. So how are we you know, asking people to make incredibly big life, life uh, change, habit changes, but we're more than happy to undo all of that in a few hours flying about all the time? And you know, I'm just interested that there hasn't been a single conversation about that today. Uh, just, just a comment, it's not really a question about it, but... I, I feel your pain as well, and I said this last week as well. It's um, There is a lot of clam anxiety, and you, you mentioned that as well. I, I think we've got to try and not take too much guilt on our shoulders. We've got to want this topic to be talked about and something to be done about. So I think, again, you know, recognising that we are a bit hypocritical. I'm the same. At home, I am consuming, but then... The, the presentation I did last week, I, I gave a, uh, an example of my wellies that I fixed because I just couldn't bring myself to throw them away because I thought, I've only just bought them three months ago. So I ended up repairing wellies, but then I felt a real sense of surrealism that I'm repairing wellies, and then you look around at the massive infrastructure projects and the air pollution, just what am I doing kind of a thing. So I guess what I'm saying is don't feel guilty about that, just recognise it within you. And, and the other just final point, and I saw, again, it's at COP today, but... Um, they're having a debate about the voluntary carbon market. Offsetting has been seen as a dirty word, and I think we've got to change the narrative. We've got to invest in nature and do it quickly, but yet we've created this really sort of bad culture where everyone thinks, oh, no, investing in offsetting is just, like, delaying the problem. But, you know, we, we, the, the things that we could do as well, we are going to have to travel, aren't we? But, you know, why, why wouldn't we offset? Why wouldn't we invest in nature? Nature needs our helping hand right now, and it needs money. I'm not saying it's um, you know a gout clause, but of course people are going to have to travel, and so that, that's just my thoughts individually. I think it also goes back to the comment I made earlier about absolutism, and we can get hung up on trying to be the absolute pinnacle of eco or whatever it is, but we live in a society that is based on oil, so you are only ever going to be constrained by that. What it comes down to is we all have to make our own individual choices and be able to live with it and understand what the choices and the meaning of the choices that we make. Thank you. 
Yeah, and these are exactly the same topics that do come up in our eco-anxiety sharing circles and the same topics I'm sure you have with your colleagues, your friends, you know, when you're just thinking something out loud and actually it develops an amazing conversation like this, which helps us to cope with the guilt that we might feel from those behaviours because we exist and there is a, a cost of existing. So everything that we're doing, you know, you can't do absolutely everything to be carbon neutral or to be carbon negative there's always going to be an imprint but it's understanding that and deciding which are the things that we choose to care about i know lots of my friends don't fly anymore but i still choose to fly i've massively reduced it but there are certain other things which i have changed to say okay well i'm already trying my best with that and that's the thing that i'm choosing to specialize in so i'm going to try and not feel guilty for the things that i am choosing to do and we've all got to try and work out how best to manage that and to help others manage that as well i think if you're in an industry and you working from the supply chain, it's your messaging is important. You know, I heard a good quote the other day from Hugh Montgomery. I hope he doesn't mind me quoting him, but he's like, sustainability is like pregnancy. You are or you aren't. You can't just be a little bit pregnant. <laughs> like, as, an, as, a, as an organization, you can't sort of just go out there and be like, we're sustainable because we've got a recycling bin. No, tell us what you're actually doing. We're not, we know you're not going to be completely net zero now. Not many people are, but give us your data. Tell us what your road map is. Give us information. And it's the same on a personal level. You know, I may well be wearing vegan shoes today, <laughs> but I'm flying to South Korea next year because I quite want to go and visit the world. Yeah, it's terrible, isn't it? <laughs> you know, I feel terribly guilty about it. You know, I'm not completely plant-based, but I'm standing here on a stage telling everyone to do all this stuff. But we all need to do it something. I need to be a lot better. You know, but I think we need to be careful how we display ourselves and display our businesses as well. Just be honest and be transparent with what you're doing and what you aim to achieve. Kieran, you've got a question for us. Thanks, Johnny. M more of a comment, really, um, because I saw a report recently about international conferences and all the efforts that were made regarding food and accommodation were dwarfed by the, the travel. The travel was the big, and it was flights. It was the, the big, yeah, yeah, the other things are tiny. Um, and, uh, and, and all the bonus say is that some, there's not always an alternative, but, but sometimes there is, I think. I, um, I, ran a, sorry, thank you. I ran an online event the other day and um, I asked everyone if this had have been face to face and I picked a random place in the centre of England, how, how far would you have travelled? And it was 39,000 kilograms of CO2 would have been used, which was the equivalent of powering eight homes for a year. Um, and again, the reason I wanted to do that is because without us quantifying it, we never have a frame of reference. No one, and I don't mean to be critical, but we won't have worked out what the carbon footprint is of today, and we, we don't. So that's, that's why carbon accounting, I put it in my presentation, is massively important to me. We just need to keep finding the numbers to help us understand. And, and your slides were brilliant as well, because it makes you sort of sit up a little bit. God, I didn't realise that that compared to that, you know, makes all the difference. So I, th I think interesting as well, if from, a, from a business perspective, well, actually, if you are on a sustainability journey, that sh surely comes into part of it. And when you're justifying your business travel and what you will and won't do. So for we, we've, um, I think there's a report today that the NHS is going to ban all in, in UK domestic flights. But again, it's that from a business point of view, that's signalling to your own staff what you're willing to do. And I've also seen other organisations where they're putting in place um, carbon budgets for travel for their staff. So again, it's things like that that you can begin to build in to kind of get to get to, get to that point of actually, is a conference worth it in person? Is the carbon we have to spend worth it? Are we going to get out of that a deliverable or some action or some insight that we'll be able to spend and invest to reduce carbon elsewhere? We've got time for one more question. Fine. Well, I really want to thank you all three of you for your incredible presentations today. Let's give them a round of applause.